the, the word ecocide, I mean, it's, it, it's so powerful. I mean, it comes from the Greek and Latin, literally means to kill one's home is actually the etymological root. And there's something so evocative about that um, in terms of how it encapsulates what's happening to the planet, that it has a kind of internal momentum of its own. So describing mass damage to nature as ecocide in itself is a powerful thing to do. And you only need to, you know, put, put the search term into Google to realize how live that conversation now is. Five years ago, when you did that, you might come up with three or four things. We used to get a Google alert once every couple of months, you know, now they're like every day, many of them. I mean, this is, this is coming up all the time now. Welcome to each of you from around the world. We're so happy that you joined us for this conversation. Can international law prevent mass ecological destruction? We are honored today to be joined by author Judy Schwartz and the co-founder and executive director of Stop Ecocide International, Jojo Mehta. I am Beck Mordini, the executive director of Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. For 10 years, bio for climate has been sharing the science and the stories of the power of restoring ecosystems to stabilize the climate. We are delighted to bring you this presentation in partnership with the GBH Forum Network as part of our Life Saves the Planet series. Jojo Mehta co-founded Stop Ecocide International in 2017 alongside the late barrister and legal pioneer Polly Higgins. This is to support the establishment of ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court. They now have representation and associate deems in over 45 countries and they generate fertile collaborations at diplomatic and political levels. And we're excited to learn more about this work. Judy Schwartz is a well-known author to the Bio for Climate community. She tells stories that explore and illuminate scientific concepts and cultural nuance. She takes a clear-eyed look at global environmental, economic, and social challenges and finds the insights and solutions in natural systems. She writes for numerous publications, including The Guardian, Discover, Scientific American, Manga Bay, and Yale E360. Her latest book, The Reindeer Chronicles, is a global tour of earth repair, featuring stops in Norway, Spain, Hawaii, New Mexico, and beyond, and you should definitely read it. So we are so pleased to have both of you here today. So Judy, I am going to turn it over to you. So Jojo, it is wonderful to see you. Jojo and I had the chance to meet in Reykjavik back in 2023. And it was kind of random on my end because I was passing through Reykjavik on the way back from visiting my brother who lives in Sweden. So I figured I might as well get to know that route back to the US. And so we stopped in Iceland and it turned out that there was a panel on ecocide law with distinguished guests and and members of parliament in Iceland and really it was so compelling i knew a little bit about ecocide law but found just really got to understand some of the nuances and i since then i've felt committed to really helping lift up or raise awareness of what the potential of ecocide law is. So Jojo, for the audience, because I know it's it's complex and so well thought out, can you kind of give us a little primer? Tell us what ecocide law is and how it works. Thanks so much, Judith. It's lovely to see you again. It's great to be here. Um, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Um, yeah, so ecocide as a concept has it, it is increasingly understood now around the world, I think, to mean mass damage and destruction of nature. So ecocide law effectively is a legal approach to dealing with mass destruction of nature, um, essentially the criminalization of the worst harms. Um, and our organization, Stop Ecocide International, has been working for a number of years to sort of develop this and move it forward at the legislative level, but also at the level of engaging with the public and um, effectively raising awareness around this concept. Um, the concept itself dates back from 1970, when the term was first coined to describe the awful damage that was created during the Vietnam War by the defoliant Agent Orange. So this really horrific damage to the natural world. 
And that was what was what first inspired the word. It was first used on the diplomatic stage at the first UN Environment Conference in Stockholm in 1972 by the Swedish leader, in fact, Olaf Palmer. Um, but you could say that it, I mean, it sort of languished a bit in a sort of legal and political backwater almost for some decades. Um, and it was resurrected by um, my dear departed colleague and friend, uh, the Scottish barrister Polly Higgins, um, who is sadly no longer with us. She died of cancer in 2019, but we we co-founded what is now Stop Ecoside International together. Now, Polly effectively had been searching for uh, what she, I mean, the answer to a question, really. She was looking for the answer to a question that she had, that had come to her. As a barrister, you know, how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? And this actually sort of drove her out of her courtroom career and into furious research, looking into what might be the best approach for this. And the the sort of nub of this is that when she was researching the, um, she actually did some research in that literally in the kind of archives underneath the UN in Geneva with some some um, law law students, and what they discovered was that. When the precursor to the Rome Statute, the Rome Statute being the governing document of the International Criminal Court, the precursor to that was a code being developed by the International Law Commission in the 1990s. And there was a clause that would have addressed severe widespread and long term harm. Now, that clause was dropped from the code at a certain point. Um, they couldn't discover any vote. That, that, that led to that. But there were certain countries that stood in the way of it or that, that objected to it in the, in the minutes of various meetings. Those were the US, the UK, France, the Netherlands, and at one point, Brazil. Very interestingly, all oil states. And at the time, also, those first four certainly were either already engaged in or contemplating engaging in nuclear testing. So we can see a number of reasons why they might not have wanted that to remain in the draft code for the peace and security of mankind, which was that that uh, code that was being developed. That, as I say, was a precursor to the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court. Now, the International Criminal Court, as you may well know, deals with the crimes that are considered of most serious concern to the international community as a whole. In other words, atrocity crimes, war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, more recently, the crime of aggression. So what Polly asked herself is, you know, what world would we be in now? What would we be living in now if ecocide or mass destruction of nature had actually been part of that document when the court opened its doors in 2002? And I don't think it takes a huge amount of a, a huge sort of leap of imagination to realise that we might be in a very, very different place. And so what she um, really dedicated what turned out to be the last 10 years of her life to was resurrecting this concept of ecocide and effectively with a view to ultimately having it adopted at the International Criminal Court alongside those atrocity crimes. So that's the kind of backstory, if you like, to, to, to what we're doing. So what is ecocide? I mean... So much of our collective actions on the planet are harmful. We see this all the time. How do you define it? And yeah, how 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 do you how do you what what makes it a crime? So th there are, of course, a number of well, many, in fact, environmental laws around the world, many of which are intended to to protect, uh, as, as many of this audience will know. Um, but as many of this audience will also know and no doubt be frustrated by those laws at present are not proving adequate to sort of slow to, to, to adequately slow the level of destruction that we're seeing on the planet, whether that be um, through mass deforestation, whether that be through um, through you know, direct pollution incidents, whether that be through air pollution. And there's so many different, uh, as we know, so many different instances of, of mass harm to nature. Um, and there are some environmental crimes, although most environmental law sits in the regulatory sphere. Um, what we are effectively facing here is quite a profound cultural issue, which is that as a, a sort of as a culture, particularly as a Western globalized economic culture, um, because that's, you know, our global economic system has built up around the Western way of thinking, um, we have a a very actually what increasingly dangerous tendency not to take environmental damage seriously enough. 
Um, we, you know, we, we have th this this whole system has grown up around um, an attitude towards nature that is about sort of treating treating nature as a bank of resources, as an ultimately as an infinite bank of resources, which we, you know, intellectually we may know that that's absolutely not the case, but we continue to behave economically as if it as if it were. Um, and so there's something very deeply culturally embedded there that I think, you know, comes very strongly from the Western canon, from that kind of separation of, you know, um, you know, reason from emotion of, of, you know, humanity from the natural world. You know, there's a whole series of dualisms that, that, that the Western canon is built on. Um, and, and so in order to, I guess, sort of make some kind of a difference to that, those cultural perceptions, there are not that many systemic levers that can work quite fast, but criminal law is one of them because criminal law accesses uh, the kind of moral aspect of how we behave in our societies. So, you know, murder is a crime, obviously the way it works is by punishing murderers, but the, the actual function of having murder as a crime is to stop people from killing each other. It's a protective function. And it's a function whereby we understand what we accept as a society and what we don't. In other words, there is a profound taboo around the destruction of people, quite rightly so. Um, but we don't yet have that in regard to destruction of nature. Now, of course, there is a balance to be struck. You can't build a house without at least killing a few insects. I mean, you know, there is a balance in regard to human and human activity and the natural world. But what we have lost is precisely that balance. And what we believe at Stop Eastside International and what is increasingly um, sort of entering the, the global political conversation is the idea that if you name the worst crimes, and, they, and it, they do have to be severe if you're going to place it alongside those atrocity crimes, you know, if you name the worst crimes, you are actually creating a sort of enforceable foundation that can support the rest of the body of environmental law around the world. And so that, that there's a kind of almost an acupunctural function here in the sense that there's, it's a very specific thing to, to sort of call for, you know, a specific crime to be added to a list. It, it's very specific. But at the same time, it has that potential for a systemic impact. Right. I remember being struck by the role of eco, that ecocide law can play in deterrence. And also when you described a cultural shift that many people find themselves like that there, there's a tension. So someone may, may believe this would harm nature. I don't want to be involved in it. You know, let's say as a business person or, um, you, you know, whatever the, the situation is. And yet within our structure, we, a company say, are forced to, honor the needs of the shareholders above, say, the um, integrity of a watershed. And I remember vividly, you said that business leaders are begging us to move forward on ecocide law so that they're not caught in that tension, but rather have a tool. They have a, a placard <laughs> that they can <laughs> show to say, no, we are not going to build this mine or something of the sort. Yeah, it's, it's the, the deterrent function is ultimately what we're looking for here. Um, I mean, particularly in the context that actually um, much of the worst harm to nature is happening during peacetime. I mean, of course, I mean, we can, we, there's a whole another aspect to this, which is environmental harm and conflict. And that's obviously hugely you know, re relevant and live at this point in the, in the sort of geopolitical situation we have right now. But the fact is that ecocide is, is also has a sort of everyday, unfortunately, uh, an everyday presence in the sense that it is often it is collateral damage, uh, exactly as you just uh, outlined in a way of, of economic activity that does not necessarily set out deliberately to destroy the environment. But that that is a side effect of it. But of course, um, you know those, as you say, those you know those CEOs, those boards of directors, um, at the moment they have you know a range of environmental obligations. But they're notoriously, particularly in the, you know the larger companies, are very good at kind of gaming that system, and and effectively um, you know their risk managers and their legal counsels kind of looking at the the sort of categories of you know um, prohibited activities or the the exact amounts of certain toxins that they're allowed to use, and, and effectively sort of saying, 
well, you know, we're not doing that, we're doing something slightly different, and therefore it doesn't fall into that category. Or, um, you know, we're allowed to use, you know, this particular substance in this context, and therefore we're all right. Or, of course, worst case scenario, what kind of compensation might we have to pay if things get, if things go all right and somebody takes us to court versus what are the profits we're going to make? And of course, that shareholder, those fiduciary obligations come in in terms of, you know, making the decision that is going to make the company the most money as opposed to what is actually going to be the best for the living world. But of course, again, this is where criminal law is very important. And I will come back to I mean, I know you mentioned the actual definition and we will come back to that because I think it's very important. Um, but effectively, what um, the, the, the criminal aspect means that it can't be ignored. I mean, to give a very basic example, you're not going to go to a government and say, can I have a license to kill 500 people for my new infrastructure project? I mean, it's literally not even going to cross your mind. Um, and so what we want is for mass destruction of nature to sort of end up in that category so that rather than a constant sort of game of mitigating risk, what you actually start doing is avoiding hazard, which is a different attitude. And, and that and I think that's a good moment, actually, to bring in the definition, because um, there's something about the definition that is currently in circulation and that has actually um, been moving forward the sort of legislative discussions at high level. And we can come back to the program on that as well. Um, it has some very specific characteristics. Um, with your permission, Judith, I'll just share my screen briefly. So e ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Now, as you can see there, this, this definition came from an independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide, which was a panel that was convened by our foundation uh, back in 2021. Now that um, was, there, there had been various different definitions of ecocide over the years, um, you know, most not no, nobody would have heard of. Um, but of course, you know, a lawyer deciding what they think it might look like is not the same as having something with a level of credibility you can take to a government and, and ask them to move it forward. Um, and that's what this drafting panel did. Um, we, we convened uh, 12 top lawyers from around the world to work together for six months to come up with a definition. And the the beauty of that definition, um, I'll just actually I'm just going to pop it back on because there's something I want to highlight here, is that what you've got is you've got sort of two main thresholds. Firstly, the damage has to be severe. So um, severe and either widespread or long-term damage. And that's the, the, you know, the threshold for the actuality of obviously substantial likelihood is, is before it actually happens clearly. Um, but then there's also um, another aspect here, unlawful or wanton. Um, so I'm just gonna talk briefly about that because um, what the, one of the big differences between this approach and the approach of most environmental regulation is that in in the regulatory sphere, things are often very detailed lists of do's and don'ts. Whereas with this definition, what you're looking at is it's almost a context where you're saying, well, whatever you do, it shouldn't hit this level of harm. It shouldn't it shouldn't be this damaging. And what that does is it it speaks back to what I was just mentioning about that. Instead of kind of calculating risk, you're actually trying to avoid hazard. Um, and, and a good way to think about this is almost like a criminal version of a health and safety law. So if you build a factory, for example, you don't build it deliberately so that it almost breaks people's heads open all the time, as in you don't play with that edge. Um, and instead you avoid it you know you, you basically make sure that you build what you build in such a way that it's not going to break anybody's heads open and that's the same principle that's at work here and actually it has a kind of intuitive resonance with the, what we already understand about criminal law so um let's take murder or manslaughter it's not how you do it that makes it murder or manslaughter it's the fact that somebody ends up dead um, and it's the same principle that's in operation here. And what's so important about that is that there has to be an actual kind of mental shift in the attitudes of those people who are making sort of those those key senior decisions, because effectively they in, you know, instead of being able to kind of gain that system, they actually have to think, you know, they have to actually have their operational people talk to them and say, what is happening on the ground and is it likely to create this level of harm? And that creates a kind of a reality check that currently is not happening um, you know, at the, at the boardroom level. Um, and what that does beyond you know, obviously create that sort of safety parameter is it also creates a set of parameters within which 
those those decision makers can actually steer their decision making in a new direction and can potentially also frame genuine innovation because what it will do is provoke questions oh well in that case you know if we can't use you know concrete in this way or if we can't you know extract using these particular methods or you know what what are the questions that we need to be asking and those are currently questions that not enough people are asking and the ones who are the sustainability leaders have an almost impossible task of it because they're constantly sort of pushing this boulder uphill of, of trying to do the right thing. Um, and, and it's virtually impossible for them to actually also, for example, be market leaders. So, you know, so this reframe, you can start to sort of see the multiple benefits of having this criminal law reframe. Okay, excellent. Um, so another thing that made a big impression on me. I know this is a really difficult question, but it's it's just sitting on my mind so much. Um, at the panel in Reykjavik, there was a member of parliament from Ukraine, mm -hmm. and she talked about the ecological harms mm -hmm. occurring in her country, which were rather devastating. So what can this, and today is October 7th, marking a year of incredible escalation of mm -hmm. damage and destruction of all kinds, including ecologically, which often doesn't get mentioned. What might this law do about war? This is a really fundamental question at present in, in the world that we're in. Um, and it, the, it, it's interesting, in fact, to see that those nation states that are moving this forward most strongly um, currently are Vanuatu from the Pacific, which is at the front line of climate change, and Ukraine in the context of conflict. Um, at, at present, there hasn't been state level discussion in the Middle East around ecocide, but that may well come. Um, but Ukraine as a state has been quite clear that they support the criminalization of ecocide. And it you're quite right that it's a, a diff, you know, it's a very different context to peacetime um uh, situations of, of environmental destruction. Um, because almost war almost by definition is is creating mass environmental harm. There's no you know, it's 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 virtually impossible for that not to be the case. Um, and also, as you say, there is a lack of focus on nature and the effects on, of nature, but uh, on nature of of conflict, but also the subsequent human rights implications of what happens environmentally during conflict. Because, um, and and this is something Ukraine often uh, have often said is that is that you know nature is kind of the silent victim in war. Um, and yet there are so many incredibly broad ramifications, whether that's the ability to produce food, whether that's toxicity in an environment that could last well beyond the time of the conflict, whether that's contamination that actually passes beyond the um, geographical area of the conflict. So there's, there's so the environmental damage actually has this sort of extension in space and time um, in a way that's that can be hugely, hugely damaging at the same time. Uh, putting in place a, a, a law of ecocide um, is unlikely to have the same kind of effect as potentially during peacetime in the context of corporate activity, where, as we were talking about, it's very it's a very strong deterrent and a steer. Now, when you come to a conflict situation, you're often talking about an ideolo ideologically motivated situation. You're probably not talking about decision makers who necessarily, uh, you know, care separately to what they're doing to people, to what they're doing to the environment. You know, so it's not going to have the same kind of deterrent function um, or it's unlikely, shall we say, to have the same kind of deterrent function. However, what it can do, and I do believe this is important and clearly Ukraine believes it's important and others do, too. Um, is that it creates a level of justiciability. So it means that there is actually a way to focus on something very specific and to say this is an unacceptable level of damage and it should be answered for in and of itself. Um, and that does that that speaks more to to the justice aspect. It speaks also to bringing into people's consciousness, whether they're actually part of the conflict or not, bringing to their consciousness what the environmental impacts are. And, you know, and, and as I say, those often extend well beyond the, 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 the geography and the timescale of the conflict. So, you know, we feel it is hugely, hugely important 
that ecocide is recognized in and of itself in the context of well in fact in all contexts i mean it's what it's why we advocate for a standalone crime actually so that it can be applied to 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 various different contexts um and it's interesting as well i think this also speaks to that second threshold in the definition the one of 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 unlawful or wanton because um you know, obviously I can understand very much, and certainly with this audience, there will be people thinking, well, hang on, shouldn't that level of destruction be, um, you know, a serious crime in any context? Why should it have to already be unlawful? But actually, when we look both at the, the, the rules for military engagement, but we also look at the international laws that already exist, and also the environmental laws that already exist, what we find is that you know, a large proportion of the worst harms are in fact already illegal. They're already in breach of a rights framework, you know, an environmental legal framework in some way or other aspects of international law. Um, and when we talk about an international crime, if we're going to talk about something at that level, normally international crimes don't create new offences. What they do is they elevate um breaches of existing law to a higher level and of course the 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 ultimate effect of that is that it creates a kind of foundational layer that gives an enforceability and a strength to other aspects of the law so whether it's actually in con in the context of um of peacetime or of conflict what this what this law will do is create a level of recognition that mass harm to nature you know, when you put it alongside mass harm to humans, you actually see that that there's a there's a level of you know the same level of severity and and fundamentally of danger that is involved with mass destruction of the environment, just as there is with mass destruction of people. It is interesting to think about bringing more visibility to the impacts of conflict on nature because it's not for it's not in the foreground in our you know, everyday news and, you know, so um, you mentioned that there are states that are moving forward with ecocide and bringing ecocide law into their statutes. And I've seen an acceleration of interest and media and discussion around this. So mm -hmm. bring us up to speed in terms of where is this being applied? And I'd love to hear your thoughts about what is what is driving this acceleration. So really, that's a really good question, and I th I think there are a number of factors that that are driving it. But just to give a brief sense of where we're at at this sort of political level, and and in terms of this kind of legislative direction of travel, almost you could call it. Um, so. And to give you a sense of when we talk about acceleration, to give you a sense of how fast this conversation is moving at government level. In 2019, after Polly died, um, there were no at that point, there were no governments publicly talking about ecocide. So that was five, five and a half years ago. Um, and no, not even that five years ago, five years ago. And now we have a situation where there are a number of individual national jurisdictions where ecocide law ecocide laws have been proposed and just just to name a handful um brazil mexico italy the netherlands scotland um and even somewhere that the, the, the ecocide as an international level crime has been adopted so belgium for example in in europe was was the first to um it actually adopt a national law, but could acknowledging ecocide as a very serious international level crime. Um, there are there are there are some states that already had it in their legislation, in their penal codes, but it hadn't been used. And actually, Ukraine's one of those, and they are actually now using, beginning to put cases together around around ecocide. But we've also seen the EU as a whole adopting a directive, an environmental crime directive, which is a, a revision of, of, of a 2008 directive, but it's just been revised over the last two, three years. Um, and that now includes what they're calling a qualified offence, which could address some conduct comparable to ecocide. I put it in quote marks. That's how they are using the language. And it's the first time the word ecocide has been included in EU law. And that happened earlier this year, political agreement was at the end of last year and the adoption was this year, which means that 25 states um, in Europe 
so 25 of the 27, are under obligation to harmonise with that directive over the next two years. So, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a kind of very clear foundation being laid at the EU level for, for ecocide as a potential, ultimately, as a standalone crime. And then most excitingly and most recently, just a month ago, um, three Pacific Island states, Vanuatu, which has always been a, a real uh, leader in this space, Vanuatu, uh, Fiji and Samoa, um, actually formally tabled an amendment to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, proposing to add ecocide as a fifth international crime. So this is an absolutely huge milestone. In fact, this is, so we've really had two huge milestones this year, the EU um, developments and the actual proposal at the ICC. So, and, and when you think about the fact that, you know, that's five years now, for international law to go from zero to EU legislation and an international criminal court proposal in five years, I mean, that's rocket speed. That's incredibly fast. I mean, it took decades to put the Paris Agreement together. And, you know, and let's face it, it doesn't have really any teeth. Um, you know, and and whereas, and I think that that comes around to the second part of your question in a way, which is that, you know, what is it that is actually, you know, driving this acceleration? And I think one of the elements is precisely the frustration with the fact that the multilateral environmental agreements we have in place, like the Paris Agreement, um, simply don't have the level of, uh, of being binding and of having sort of enforceable teeth, if you like, um, to actually create that shift, that, that, that sort of shift in mentality, if you like, that I was talking about earlier, and that something more muscular is needed. And I think there's there, there's, an, there's a, a strong element of that in the, the fact that this, this conversation has gained so much traction. I mean, if we think about the Convention on Biological Diversity, I mean, the Kunming Montreal Global Bi Biodiversity Framework that came out of COP15 in Montreal, um, you know, if, if all states were following that, we'd actually be in a much better place. I mean, you know, it's actually a really good document. But of course, it, it, you know, all of these documents are different degrees of non-binding. So there's this constant sense that we're relying on kind of incentives and, and you know, goodwill and, you know, people wanting to do the right thing. When, of course, you know, a lot of the, 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 the biggest uh, economic players are, are simply controlled by the bottom line. And sometimes, you know, and often that that is actually the structure of how they're created. It's not even like you've got a Bond villain sitting there stroking his white cat going, ha, 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 I'm destroying the world. It's actually that that's just the way that our economic system has been set up um and so you know it, 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 there's there's something about needing a more powerful element to come in at the systemic level that can kind of trump all of that um in the sense that you know it doesn't matter what trade agreements are in place you still do not have permission to go commit murder or genocide, or any of those things. So you know, there's a kind of base level um, that that the that the uh, criminal law speaks to. Um, so yeah, so this is a very very exciting time in terms of how fast this is progressing. Um, and as the Vanuatu ambassador said recently, now the real diplomatic work begins. And I think that's important actually to perhaps bring this in because. Um, you know, while this organization started as a very grassroots um, phenomenon, if you like, um, you know, sort of placards and demonstrations and, you know, stop ecocide and, and, you know, which is absolutely still remains a demand in many, you know, in many, many contexts. In terms of what we do as an organization, the conversation has actually become quite high level. So we we actually address, I mean, you, you know, we spend quite a bit of our time in, in kind of more closed door situations with ambassadors, with diplomats, with politicians and so on, briefing and advising and, 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 um, assisting, I suppose, um, at, at that level, at the same time as constantly building the communication around around this um, around this work. And I think um, so. So there's there, there are those aspects. There's also the, the, coming back again to the grassroots thing, the mobilizations that we've seen in the last few years. I mean, particularly a few years ago, the, the, the Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement, you know, these these kind of grassroots movements had an absolutely essential function in the sense that they broke the conversation open and in that kind of disruptive way that was needed in order for that space to arise, if you like, into which something like what we're doing with ecocide law could step. And I think when we're looking at that, we can also see the parallels with historic moments where particular rights have been won. I mean, whether we look at the abolition of slavery, whether we look at votes for women or the civil rights movement, in all those cases, you see disruptive grassroots action 
followed by legal change. And that is, so that is in a sense, that is the sequence that, that we feel that we're a sort of part of, I think, with this work. What are the teeth? So if a <laughs> company, a government, an individual commits ecocide, is it a tisk tisk? You know that was that's a no no. Or what are the real consequences? So I think the the most obvious one is potential jail time, because I think you know that that criminal that that criminal layer of responsibility and the fact that it accrues to an individual is very very important. So although obviously when you come to things like compensation or potentially rest restorative aspects in sentencing, then we, you, you probably do want to have that extended to corporations or to potentially to governments, I suppose. But, um, but in terms of an internet, when we're looking at an international crime, we're looking very specifically at individual responsibility for actual physical persons. And the important thing with, uh, with that is that it has a completely different level of sort of deterrence and, and, and responsibility compared to a company. So we already have a situation where companies will get a slap on the wrist and a fine. Um, but of course, you know, a big company making a large profit is not going to mind that. That's not, you know, that's not going to be a deterrent as such. But if one of their C-suite executives gets a tap on the shoulder, you know, even if that case does not end up in a, in a, in a conviction, what will actually happen is that that person's personal reputation, their personal freedom will be at stake, which means that they can't just waltz off into another job or carry on taking their bonuses or all of those sorts of things. Um, but also it has this sort of double layer of deterrence because it also has a knock on effect on the company's reputation. And hence, and this is very important, the company's stock value. So I mean, we only need to look at what happened with the Enron case when the fraud was exposed, the stock value tanked. And this is obviously, you know, so it means that the, the, the business world in particular is actually quite sensitive to these things. Um, and so there, you know, there's a very real uh, level of deterrence there that there isn't in this sort of system of fining and, um, you know, as you say, the sort of court, slap on the corporate wrist. Um, so I think that that is one of the really key, key elements here. Um, at the same time, and uh, this speaks to, I mean, there were, there were a couple of questions that came through um, in advance of this podcast, and one of them was about retroactivity. You know, would this law work in, retro, in retrospect? Well, the simple answer is no, that's just not generally how, how law works. Um, but also, it, weirdly, it's actually quite important that it doesn't work like that, because when you when you if you want governments to move ahead with passing a law then it's actually quite important that there are no fingers being pointed in specific directions because those are the things that actually slow down that legislative process so what what we're very much in the business of doing is showing clearly to governmental players that this is not about specific um, you know, it's not about specific accusations. It's not about necessarily, you know, wanting X or Y CEO to be in jail. It's nothing, to, it's not to do with that. You know, ultimately, this is not about punishment. This is about protecting the living world. So it's about putting something in place that's absolutely essential. Um, and so, you know, not focusing on very specific activities or specific players is actually quite important in this. Um, and, it, you know, and it means that I mean, it's an, it's an interesting line to tread because obviously it does mean that we need to stay balanced. We need to stay hyper focused on the uh, the the putting in place of the law without um, without snagging on either political partisanship or particular sectors that governments may have particular relationships with, depending on where they are in the world, uh, and all of those sorts of things. I've got a funny feeling I did a bit of a, a roundabout thing there. I'm not sure I actually answered your question. <laughs> It's fine. You brought up a lot of really important points and that helps ground this discussion. Ah, I remembered what I was going to say with the, with the, um, the retroactivity thing oh. is, is that, is that the, the, the real window for change happens not when the law comes into play. It happens between the moment that those corporations hear about it and understand it and the moment that it comes into play. And actually, you don't want that to happen overnight because they can't necessarily address what they need to address overnight. Much as we know there are cases where that's needed, actually in terms of 
you know, in a, in a sense, turning the ship around, there actually has to be the visibility on the horizon of, you know, this thing approaching, which means that, they, that there's an ability to actually comply and to steer around and to, to move in a new direction. Um, and so that's, that's why it's quite important that, you know, it, once it comes into play, it doesn't suddenly get applied backwards and say, well, you did this, at the, you know, so many years ago. It's, it's about actually aligning all of us, really, so that we're actually operating in a different way. Excellent. So we have so many really meaty questions coming in. So one question that came in earlier, how does this differ? How does ecocide law, how is it differentiated from rights of nature, which is another legal mm. kind of line of inquiry? And are they complementary? They are definitely complementary. They're not the same thing. They're definitely complementary, though. Um, and the relationship between the rights law and the criminal law is probably most easily explained with a very simple example. So um, it, it, in the human rights sphere, our most basic human right is the right to life. But that right to life isn't worth a whole lot if murder isn't a crime. In other words, you know, it's your, your right to life is protected by the fact that taking away that life is a crime. So there's a kind of there's a sort of protective complementary relationship between uh, nature having rights and nature being protected by criminal law. Um, and of course, with nature rights as well, there are different sort of aspects to it. You know, there's there's a kind of legal personhood for certain, um, you know, landscape features or so on. And then there's 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 nature rights more generally and how that, how that, those things work. Now, I'm not an, I'm not an expert on nature rights, but we do work alongside those who are working on nature's rights. And what what I find interesting about this um, landscape is, um, to quote a phrase, is that um, nature, you know, the nature's rights or legal personhood for nature have been established in probably at least 30 jurisdictions now in particular cases. So it's actually quite a, um, it's quite a broad and strong movement. And it's a, you know, sort of, it's a legal accumulation of jurisprudence and case law that is really building up over the years. Um, ecocide law in comparison is, is, is sort of quite specific and less sort of heterogeneous. It's quite straight, sort of straightforward in a way, I suppose. In, um, but it's also a little easier to fit into an existing system. I mean, actually, um, I mean, you know, murder was a crime long before human rights were even a concept. Um, you know, so there's something very sort of fundamental to the way we think about law that, that actually ecocide law fits into quite easily. Whereas the whole concept of nature having legal rights and legal personhood is actually a much, is in a sense, it's a more, more of a systemic shift overall than ecocide law is, which, you know, we can relate to. I mean, for example, you know, you can, you, it, it can be a crime to harm certain animals, even if the animals don't have their own rights kind of thing. So, so, so there's, there's it, you know, you don't have to have nature's rights in place in order to make ecocide a crime. Um, at the same time, when ecocide is a crime, clearly you're actually shifting the whole system towards more of a sense that you know of the importance of nature and of course there is this it's sort of slightly insane thing where you know a corporation has legal personhood but you know the living world has to sort of somehow win it case by case um you know which doesn't doesn't feel quite fair <laughs> to put it to put it bluntly um but yes the two things do definitely definitely work together and in parallel i would say Okay, so you mentioned that corporations have legal personhood. Um, you may be referring to law in the United States, which brings up, I, I don't think that's universal. Um, I hope I'm, I hope I got that right. Um, so in seeing this acceleration of the conversation and the high level discussions about ecocide law, one place where, at least from my perspective, from what I see, is that the U.S. is has been lagging behind. Anything you want to say about where this is gaining traction in the U.S., how people concerned about the state of nature and interested in bolstering protection for nature, what we could do, how we could get involved, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. 
So, so we have, um, I mean, our, our international team is sort of loosely UK based, but we actually have teams and associate groups in about 50 countries. And we do actually have um, a, a team in the US. Um, in the US, we have been focusing more on the narrative than on the politics, just because, I mean, well, for a number of reasons, one of which is that the US actually isn't a member of the International Criminal Court. Um, and in fact, well, as you probably know, I mean, historically has had some issues and, and is currently, I would say, in a slightly confused place with regard to international criminal law in the sense that, you know, obviously a, a, a warrant for the arrest of Putin was welcomed by the US, a warrant for the arrest of Netanyahu was less so. Um, and, and yet we're obviously still talking about exactly the same set of rules. Um, however, and, and the other aspect, of course, <laughs> that comes into play is that, you know, no one will have missed that you're in an election year, um, and uh, and what we have and, and this this is not obviously just been the US. This year has been a massive election year across the world, um, including in my home country, the UK. Um, and what we have attempted to do with regard to ecocide law is keep it out of election discussions because this is it, we believe this is so fundamentally important. It's so ultimately common sense and foundational to how we should be behaving, you know, with in regard to our position on the planet, that we don't want it kicked around as a partisan football. Um, and we, you know, we don't want it uh, becoming a kind of left-right divide or a you know red-blue divide or whatever that is. So what we have been doing is in a sense, is waiting till a new government is elected and then approaching that government. Um, and we would suggest that that is, would be the, the, you know, the way that we would also approach things in the US. Now, interestingly, ecocide law has a quite a, a sort of, uh, it, it crosses the divide, actually, in a way that the climate change conversation per se does not necessarily um because there's something about environmental destruction and of course you know you destroy a climate regulating ecosystem you're directly affecting climate um you know whether that's forests mangroves you know marine ecosystems and so on um but effectively the destruction of the environment is something that actually is related to quite strongly right across the board because it's something that can be seen felt um you know um witnessed if you like in a way that is perhaps more direct than what people sometimes think of as an invisible problem, um, you know, with 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 uh, the climate conversation. So that's an interesting one. Um, what we would also say is that the word itself has huge power, and this this whole um, you know this direction of travel, isn't what is now really a legal direction of travel, has really been established through, through conversation. It's about who is hearing this and in what contexts? So the way that we would we would often um, sort of parcel that up for easy digestion, I suppose, um, is to say that you know everybody listening to this will have um, networks of which they are part, um, and it may be that you know if you, I mean, we we think of it in sort of three levels: policy, public, and private. So if if your organisation or who you work with interacts with policy, or indeed as an individual, if you want to contact your elected representatives, that if you're interacting with policy in any way, bringing ecocide law into that conversation and flagging up how important it is, is, is a really fundamental thing. And so that can be done, um, as I say, it, any interaction at policy level, but also at public level. So if, you know, your if your organization produces reports, writes articles, hosts events, you know, any of these things, or has newsletters that, you know, that are publicly visible, anything like that, um, you know, or runs a podcast like this one, um, you know, this is, there, there is, there are opportunities there to bring this conversation into the mix. Um, and that, the, the word ecocide, I mean, it's, it's so powerful. I mean, it comes from the Greek and Latin, literally means to kill one's home is actually the etymological root. And there's something so evocative about that um, in terms of how it encapsulates what's happening to the planet, that it has a kind of internal momentum of its own. So describing mass damage to nature as ecocide in itself is a powerful thing to do. And you only need to, you know, put, put the search term into Google to realize how live that conversation now is. Five years ago, when you did that, you might come up with three or four things. We used to get a Google alert once every couple of months, you know, now they're like every day, many of them. I mean, you know, this is this is coming up all the time now. And that is a result of those conversations. And the, the final one, of course, is the private sphere, which, you know, could literally be your own personal network. Um, because, and, and I, I would say that, 
over the years, one of the things that has been absolutely consistent in how we've moved this forward is connectivity. It's about who are you talking to and who do they know? Um, and you know, and, and it's, it's really extraordinary how that sort of network spreads. It's like a mycelium. It's like an underground mycelium. I love that image. Um, you know, that kind of connects all the different living nodes. So, you know, uh, we never, you know, we're always very encouraging of people simply talking to their personal networks. But also in, in when, when we talk about private, we can also be talking about um, sector, you know, like w w what part of the private sector, for example, you know, what is your particular area of work? And is there, I don't know, are there, is there a conference where all of those people meet in one place? You know, is there a, a, a sort of um, a, a membership association that, you know, or I don't know, you're an architect is there you know what, what's the architects members association and do they want to hear about ecocide law let's make sure they do you know th those kinds of um you know ways of thinking about it are are probably the most useful um and of course you know uh you know obviously whatever every all these kinds of um all this kind of work costs so you know obviously if you do feel like supporting us directly you can do that from our website stop ecocide.earth um but yeah we would say that the the fundamental thing that's at play here is a conversation Mm -hmm. And I, I remember hearing about and um, that faith communities are very engaged in this because, I mean, it comes right out of all faiths do have a component about stewarding the, the earth. They do. And I think it's, it's brilliant you brought this up because I literally just met somebody the other day uh, earlier that I was, I was in Geneva last week and um there was a gentleman who'd been at something called the, I think it was the Zug Declaration from a place called Zug in Switzerland, where all these different faith leaders had met together a few years ago and created a, a kind of declaration around, it was actually to do with people who wanted to invest consistent with their faith. Um, but, but all of these different faith voices were declaring those parts that came from the sacred texts in so many different ways about stewarding and caring for creation. So there is a really strong faith element here because actually, you know, it's, it's. I mean, obviously there's a very strong echo in the indigenous cultures, but not just, also in the text-based faiths as well, there's a very strong element of care for creation. So a lot of questions have come in about enforcement so um, one person wrote in, there's no international court whose decisions are accepted by all countries. But yes, I think the, the enforcement aspect is, is really important. And ultimately, um, enforcement is mostly done at the national level. So we would suggest that one, I mean, one of the reasons that uh, from the beginning that we aimed at an international crime is for coherence's sake. If you like, um, any country that ratifies an international crime is likely to include it in its own penal code um, and you know unlike with say genocide or war crimes where your own state is always by definition unlikely to prosecute you and therefore you may end up at the court of last resort which is the international criminal court it's not the purpose of the international criminal court to try all of those cases i mean you know let's say i mean if, if, if ecocide came in tomorrow and the icc was expected to deal with all the potential cases i mean it would fall over in you know about three days um that's not the best way for it to function but with ecocide law it doesn't need to it actually in a way restores the icc to its complementary role because given that, you know, particularly during peacetime, you know, ecocide is essentially a corporate issue um, in terms of the, you know, the likelihood of major damage. Those kinds of cases could be taken in any ratifying jurisdiction that has a connection with the case. And if a state decides to operate universal jurisdiction, which some states do, then potentially any case could be taken by them if it was considered to be serious enough. So, um, so yes, so the enforcement level will almost certainly come at the national level, or potentially, or possibly at the regional level. I'm thinking thinking of Europe, um, but but even that, ultimately, it will be the member states that integrate into their own uh, national jurisdictions. And of course, the scope that opens up there is for the inclusion of corporate players, for example, in the concept of ecocide, the inclusion of possibly restorative justice, the inclusion of fines as a percentage of corporate turnover, for example, which is one of the things that the EU has suggested in their in their um, directive, you know, which are, you know, can be quite substantial, you know, can be really quite, um, yeah, quite meaty as, as uh, possible sentencing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Beck? <laughs> Thank you, Judy and Jojo. What an interesting discussion. Appreciate your work. You know, when something just shows up, 
and you think, wow, that's, that's great that they just thought of that. And to think that, you know, you have been working on this for 17 years and it's an idea who's finally uh, getting the kind of support that it needs. So I, I appreciate that. It's always wonderful to have Judy with us. Uh, always knows how to put these issues into perspective and to gather the stories. And who knows what about this might be in her next book. I just don't know. Something's brewing for sure. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And I hope some of you will be able to catch up and are watching uh, the recording. Uh, I'd like to thank our partners at GBH for hosting this series and helping us reach a, a wide audience. I hope you'll follow us at bio for climate to learn more about how nature creates climate and how we can support regeneration of the natural world. Thank you everyone.